Good morning. I want to welcome all of you today on this uh, online service. Uh, it's not an option that we had. Uh, it's because of the hall being unavailable that we've had to uh, come online. But we're grateful to God that we can still be connected. And I especially want to appreciate uh, those of you who've made an effort to join with your life group and uh, to be part of the service today. But even if you are just by yourself, I believe that the Lord would minister to you and bless you and speak to you. Uh, today is the first of a three-part series on prayer. And today I want to be sharing this morning on why pray. Why do we, as a people of God, need to pray now? There can be a short answer to this. There can be a short message to this. And there can be a long message to this. And both are required. Uh, but for the purpose uh, for us to be able to have a stirring a beginning of a stirring in our heart, uh, the shifting in our heart, the change of our posture and direction towards God. Um, uh, what I'm going to be sharing today, I believe God will use it to push us in the right direction towards Him. Amen. And uh, we need to study more and more about prayer. Uh, not that we would just merely gain in knowledge, but that we would become more of a praying and a prayerful people. Um, in the last year or so, one year, uh, the Lord has been able. Uh, the Lord has actually helped me to increase uh, my prayer life. He's poured more of His grace. He's poured more of His anointing on me. He's increased my desire uh, to seek Him. Uh, not that I have prayed all of the time, but surely my prayer life has increased and it has resulted in God doing some significant things in my life and in my family. And uh, I believe now that He is going to increase my desire and move it towards praying more for the church and praying for his kingdom. Uh, the others, continuing the other parts and aspects, I'm going to continually uh, continue to pray for, but I'm believing that he's going to increase uh, the burden and the desire to pray for the church, for our city, and for our nation, for the things of his kingdom. And uh, uh, I, I want to begin by actually highlighting two kinds of people in the Bible right now. I'm going to take us to First uh, First Chronicles 12, 30. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, that's good. You need to grab your Bible and open it to First Chronicles 12.30. Uh, please get a Bible or up out on your phone or your hard copy. And I want us to look at two kinds of people and then I want to move into the message of why pray. Okay, And I'm trying to help us understand how we need to be a people who are able to discern the times and seasons that we're living in. Uh, so First Chronicles 12.30 speaks about... Um, <clears throat> the sons of, of Israel. And specifically, let's come to verse 32, actually. The sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their kinsmen were at their command. Now, this particular passage uh, or chapter is talking about, uh, you know, the details of the army of Israel and each tribe were able to contribute which kind of strength uh, which kind of uh, 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 a sort of uh, a formation in the army? Who were the swordsmen? Who were the archers? Who were the brave men? You know, what was their strength in numbers? And we come, interestingly, to a, a, a particular aspect uh, or a character of the sons of Issachar. It doesn't just name uh, how many people they had, how many fighting men they have. It speaks about a very significant quality about the sons of Issachar. And it says, these were men, the sons of Hezekiah were men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. You know, beloved, it is very important as a people of God that we are able to discern the times and seasons that we're living in. If not, we will misfire. We will misfire badly. We need to know what is the time and season. You know, we are on March 5th, uh, 2023. You know, what is God doing right now in our nation? What is it that God wants to do? What is happening right now socio-politically in our nation? What is happening economically in our nation? But even more importantly, what is happening spiritually in our nation? And how must the church position itself in such a time? What should be the church be uh, making a priority right now? Where should we be spending more of our time, 
our energy, our giftings, our anointing, our resources, our finances. What should be the church doing? And there are some things that will always need to be a priority for the church, irrespective of the age or the generation we're living in. Jesus said, my house shall be called as a house of prayer unto all nations. I believe that the greatest occupation and the greatest calling of the church and the greatest calling of a minister, a pastor, leader, apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, the greatest calling is that of being a man and a woman of prayer. And I want to highlight that. Now, let's just in contrast, go to the other uh, passage or verse in Psalms 78. And it's speaking here in Psalm 78. <clears throat> about again the people of Israel and it speaks about another tribe and their sons and the tribe of Ephraim to be specific and uh, here the writer is asking us in verse 8 be not like their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God I, I sp spoke about this uh, about a month or two back where I was talking about how it is important for us to prepare our heart in order to seek God. We need to be a people who have resolved in our hearts that we want to be faithful to God. And this particular verse is exhorting us that we should not be rebellious, we should not be stubborn. And that happens when we do not prepare our heart <clears throat> to seek God. Now, here is the interesting thing in verse 9 of Psalm 78. It says, unlike the sons of Issachar, as we read in First Chronicles, the sons of Ephraim here were archers equipped with bows. They were equipped. I'm sure that they were very good archers. Yet they turned back in the day of battle. Yet they turned back in the day of battle. So they were people of Israel. They were fighting men. They were equipped. They were archers. But in the day of battle, what use is your gifting, your talent, your skill, your equipping, your weapons of war? If you don't show up, if you don't show up where God wants you to show up. And the reason is it is direct. It is immediately after this verse on in verse eight, where it says they did not prepare their heart to be faithful to God. And it says further in verse 10, they did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. Um, and that was a state of the sons of Ephraim. You know, beloved, I want to highlight again something important over here, beloved. We need to understand the times and seasons we are living in. Jesus rebuked um, uh, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. In fact, the people of Israel who were not able to understand the time of their visitation. Here was the Messiah who had come to the people of Israel. He had come to his own, but so many were rejecting him. So many were not able to recognize him. And it was terrible. Beloved, we're in a very significant time in our nation. You know, God wants to move powerfully among this 1.3 billion people in our nation. God wants to bring a great harvest of souls in his kingdom. And here's what I want to ask us this morning. What should you and me be doing at this point of time? What should be your and my posture? And I believe the answer is simple, but very, very important. We should be a praying people. We should be a people who should be asking God to increase our desire, our burden, and the grace upon us, the anointing of God upon us in order to seek him earnestly and more passionately and more consistently and more faithfully and increasingly in prayer. We need to increase our prayer life. We need to strengthen our prayer life. The more we seek God, the more we will be in a place in order to be able to discern what God is doing, and in fact, be in a place where God will in fact move through us. God will begin to activate the things of his kingdom in and through us, and we will see that our lives are becoming fruitful for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. So I want to focus on four things today as to why we need to pray. These are things you've obviously probably heard before, but it's important to remind ourselves, I believe that there is a need to remind ourselves this morning about why we need to pray, beloved. You know, <clears throat> there are books on this and we should read it. Read more on prayer. Um, study more on prayer. Talk to one another more on prayer. Encourage and provoke one another to pray more. But here is a simple four-point message 
on why we need to pray. And may God use this to shift our hearts, to stir our hearts, and to push us more towards praying. Number one, why we need to pray is because prayer is the key dynamic of our relationship with God. Prayer is the key dynamic of our relationship with God. In fact, prayer is the is is the real foundation of our relationship with God. Uh, you know, just uh, last night, I, you know, I was talking to Anaya about how does one build a relationship, and what I was helping her understand that how communication is the key dynamic for a relationship to grow in closeness and in strength. You know, from a place where two individuals who are strangers move and become acquaintances, then move further and become friends, then they move further and become close friends, and, you know, and then are able to fulfill God's purpose for their life and their friendship, that is only possible if there is open, honest, transparent, consistent communication. Beloved, it's the same with our relationship with God. You know, the more we increase our prayer life, the more we deepen our communion and our fellowship with God, our relationship with God will grow, will become more intimate, will become more strong. You know, here is what God told the people of Israel. You know, here is, here is it in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. You know, such a beautiful, uh, you know, narrative here of the covenant relationship we have with God. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. What a beautiful way God is prophesying through the prophet Jeremiah of the covenant that you and I are in. When Jeremiah was prophesying this, he was in the old covenant. But here is it God declaring through Jeremiah about the new covenant that today you and I are in, that he has brought us in through the life, the sacrifice, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, 31 onwards. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with your fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. What a beautiful you know, narrative and introduction God is giving about the new covenant. And the essence of this new covenant is in verse 33, where God says that I will put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Beloved, Jesus paid the highest price in order to bring us into this covenant relationship with the Father and with himself in the Holy Spirit. But this covenant is a relationship. It is not a contract. It is a relationship. And in relationship, there is a requirement of communication. That is the essence of any relationship, any human relationship. How much more with the Lord? That we need to understand that prayer is a key dynamic in this covenant relationship that we have with God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And God wants us to commune with Him. God wants us to fellowship with Him. This is the beauty of the relationship that we have with them, that we can enjoy this communion, that we can enjoy this fellowship with our Lord. You know, in, in 1 John chapter 3, look at what John, uh, look at how John beautifully puts it. You know, the beauty of this covenant relationship that we have with the Lord. 1 John 3, 3. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We're not just talking of an ordinary, common fellowship, beloved. John is saying that our fellowship, our communion is with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you and I pray, beloved, we are in the presence of greatness. The greatest 
uh, people are with us. When we come into the secret place of prayer, the Father is with us. The Son is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Beloved, this is the most precious koinonia, the most precious fellowship. And beloved, we need to grow in this dynamic, in this relationship, so that we are able to experience the fullness of this new covenant that we have been brought into by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, we need to grow in prayer. Secondly, prayer is the evidence of humility. You know, I want to say this bang on, beloved. You know, why do people not pray? Because of pride. Because when we think that I can do things without God, I can live my days, I can undertake my responsibilities, I can do my work, I can lay out my roles and responsibilities without God, then we don't feel the need to pray. You know, we live our lives independent of God. We may have a label that I'm a Christian, you know, but in actuality, we are not being in Christ. We are living our lives independent of God. We are depending on our own understanding. We are depending on our own abilities. We are depending on our own strength. We are reasoning. We, we discuss with people or whatever. We do what we want to do. And then in our definition of what we think we're successful, you know, we continue to live our lives. But basically, it is, it, it is a worldly kind of life. You know, it is what we have made our own goals, our own plans. And then we, you know, take those uh, boxes or those goals that, you know, whatever it be, success in terms of career and work and whatever we are wanting to do. You know, we make sure that our weekends are entertaining and whatever. My whole point is that we don't pray. We don't pray because we don't feel the need to pray. We don't feel the need to pray because we don't feel the need of God in our lives. Let me tell you, beloved, that's a dangerous place to be. You may experience, you know, success in terms of what the world uh, understands or defines success. But eternally, you're in the danger of being bankrupt. You're in the danger of some serious eternal tragedy if we are going to indulge or live prayerless lives. Beloved, prayer is the evidence of humility because prayer is saying, God, I cannot live this life on my own. I don't want to live this life on my own. I want to live a life that's surrendered to you. I want to fulfill your plan. I want to fulfill your purpose for my life. I want to do your will, God. You know, before you formed me in my mother's womb, you chose me, God. Before you, before you, before I was born, you have called me to be yours. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. And while you were fashioning me in my mother's womb, you were fashioning the days for me. I'm not an accident. I'm a plan of God. And because I'm the plan of God, because I'm chosen by God, he has a plan and he has a purpose for my life. In his grand design for his church and for his kingdom, you and I have a precious part. And so we come to a place where we understand, say, God, I cannot uh, live this life. I cannot... I cannot even know what is your plan and purpose for my life. I'll not be able to do it also if my life is not surrendered to you. If I do not uh, appropriate your grace, if I do not grace, if I do not have uh, the power of your spirit, if I do not have your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom, if I don't have your anointing upon my life, I will not be able to do anything that's of eternal value. I will not be able to live a fruitful life. I will not be able to live a meaningful life. I will not be able to have a purposeful life if my life is not surrendered to you. If you do not come and, and intervene in my life, if you're not Lord of every area and aspect of my life, then my life is going to be barren and fruitless. And I don't want that kind of life. Lord, I want to, I want to therefore humble myself and ask because asking is humbling. You know, we met many times. Uh, people find it difficult to ask because it's like, oh man, you know, I don't want to ask. It's awkward. It's embarrassing. I mean, that's an issue that I've had. You know, I would always hesitate to ask people because I would find it embarrassing. To put it in simple words, basically, you know, I was too proud to ask. Uh, you know, when we, we suppose we're in a place where we want to find or ask directions or ask for help, we always tell somebody else, you know, why don't you ask? And you ask, you know, we don't want to ask. We don't want to be in the place where we think we are feeling awkward or we are little, uh, you know, getting ourselves in a lower position. Now, asking is humbling. 
But it's a good thing to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And beloved, that's what keeps people from praying because it's pride. Pride is what positions people to become prayerless. But it's humility. It's a, it's a humbling choice to say, God, I'm going to draw near to you. So James 4 says from verse 6 onwards to verse 8, James, the book of James chapter 4, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud actively. He pushes them away, but he gives grace. It's interesting, not to everyone, to the humble. Verse 7 says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So how do I do that? I want to be humble. I want to submit to God and, and I want to resist the devil so that he flees from me. Verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Beloved, I, I want to encourage you and request you right now, beloved. Choose humility. And if I'm saying choose humility on the basis of scripture, then you need to choose prayer. Humility looks like prayer. So if you're going to say that, God, I want to humble myself before you, I want to submit to you, then we've got to choose prayer, beloved. It is the greatest evidence of humility. And if you're going to back it up with fasting, that's even more powerful. I'm going to be teaching about fasting very soon. And one of the most powerful expressions of humility, of humbling yourself, is fasting. So when we fast and when we pray, we're humbling ourselves before God and God will release greater grace upon our lives. And do we not want that? Do we not want the outpouring of God's grace over our lives, over our families, over the church, over the city and over this nation? You know, do we not understand? Have we forgotten? That when we begin to see the outpouring of God's grace over our lives, even the land will be blessed. The people around us will be blessed. Our workplaces will be blessed. Because you and I are a covenant child of God. What God does in us and through us will overflow into the lives of other people. On the other hand, when we are choosing to be prayerless, then we are depriving even the people around us, our families and the church and the people around us from all that God could have brought in and through our lives, into their lives and into those places. Beloved, choose prayer, choose humility. Number three, we need to remember, never forget that we cannot live the Christian life on our own. Christianity is basically life in Christ. That is what Christianity, it is a life that is immersed in Christ. John 15 was 1 to verse 11. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, chapter 15, verses 1 onwards. I want to read this. Um, and hear what I believe is the voice of the Lord to us this morning. Jesus is saying, I am the true wine and my father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Who is this branch, beloved? Who is this branch? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Who is this branch? The answer will come. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Wow. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit, fruit of itself unless it abides in the wine so neither can you unless you abide in me verse 5 I am the wine you are the branches he who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit so apart from me you can do nothing you know Jesus is saying over here very clearly that he is the wine the father is the wine dresser who is watching the wine he is the wine. Jesus is the wine. The Father is the wine dresser. And we, you and me, are the branches. Simple English. 
I'm reading from the NSB, which is one of the most literal translations of the English language of the Bible. Verse 2 says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Beloved, this is a serious warning. I don't know what is your theology on salvation. But for me over here and in many other places in scripture, I have enough reason to not take my salvation for granted. And I don't want to take the warnings in scripture for granted. It's very convenient and very, very poor theology that basically says all the blessings and promises in scripture are for me, but the warnings are for somebody else or not for me. That is poor theology, beloved. If the blessings are for me and the promises are for me, the warnings are also for me. And it's wise and it's humbling and it's safe for us to take heed to these warnings. Jesus is saying, I'm the wine, you are the branches. And every branch in me that does not bear, every branch in me, every branch in me. Who do you think it's talking about? You answer it. I don't want to answer it for you. That does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, don't be disturbed by it, but invite it. It says the Lord prunes. He prunes. Who prunes? The Father prunes. He prunes so that you may become and I may become more, more fruitful. So if there's a pruning happening in your life, if God, is, as you're abiding Jesus, he's cutting away, cutting away things that are not of him. It hurts. It hurts a branch when there is a cutting away of things that are unhelpful. You know, if God's working on you, he's disciplining out of his love for you, receive it in gratitude because you are going to move into a season of more fruitfulness. But if there has been utter prayerlessness, beloved, or bare is basically, you know, very negligible prayer, praying in crisis, praying at the signal when you're stuck in traffic because you're getting late at work, praying just only at meal times. I mean, beloved, it's high time I tell you that something is wrong. And it's not rocket science to know what is wrong. There are issues of pride. There are issues of where other things of the world, maybe love of money or maybe love of career, the love of I want that vertical growth in my career. So all those things are taking, um, you know, priority in your life. And now God is getting pushed out of my life and the things of his kingdom are getting pushed out of my life. Beloved, there are going to be eternal consequences of this if that's the kind of choices we're going to make. Jesus is saying this in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. What is this fruit, beloved? Fruit was a success. Choose. Success in terms of the world. You know, the career is going up. The increments are coming. Uh, you know, the paybacks are increasing. Uh, you know, I'm moving into, you know, I'm, my lifestyle is improving. Uh, you know, my clothing brands are getting more expensive. Uh, my car is getting more, more expensive. My house is getting more expensive. But my spiritually, I'm bankrupt. Spiritually, I'm bankrupt. What is the use of that success? Because in a moment, when we move from here to eternity, everything that was of worldly value has got absolute no value for eternity. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. I'm not saying that you should not. I always clarify. I'm not saying you should not enjoy the good things that is there in this life. But don't do it at the cost of your spiritual life. And one of the biggest markers or indicators of how rich is our spiritual life is how rich or how strong is our prayer life. Because we are only as rich in our prayer life, in our spiritual lives, as rich and as strong we are in our prayer lives. That is one of the biggest indicators. Prayer and the reading and the study and the meditation of God's word. And Jesus is reminding us, I am the wine, you are the branches in verse 5. He who abides in me and I in him, he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing apart from Jesus that's of eternal value. You know, somebody has said, of course I can do a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, uh, without Jesus, without abiding in Jesus. Of course I can do a lot of things. The whole world is doing stuff without being in Jesus. I mean, look at the world, yeah? How many of them are in Jesus? How many of the seven, uh, seven billion people on this planet, 1.3 billion people in our nation are in Jesus? And look at the stuff that they're achieving. And of course, they are um, doing so much without Jesus. But it will be of no value for eternity, beloved. It will all be burnt up in the fire of his glory. And beloved, when the fire of his glory touches my life and my family, I don't want to be standing with nothing. I want to be able to stand with riches that is of eternal value. 
You will have to make a choice now, beloved. How do you want to live? Do you want to choose prayer? Do you want to choose God? Do you want to choose the things of God? There has to be a rearranging of your priorities. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Beloved, simple English. And if you have the cheek to tell yourself and the audacity to tell yourself, this is not for me. You know, I have an understanding of grace that this verse doesn't belong to me. Your understanding of grace is what? Because grace in the Bible, the way I see it is very clear. It takes me towards God. It takes me towards the things of God. It increases my, my spiritual disciplines. When we appropriate the things of God uh, and the grace of God, we begin to see sin going down. We see holiness increasing. We see prayer increasing. We see a passion for the things of God increasing. And I'm not saying this to condemn you, beloved. I'm saying this so that let the light come on this morning, beloved. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. Well, just verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you and abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Beloved, a life without prayer will be a barren and a fruitless life because it's a life that is outside of Jesus. But a life that is strengthened by Grace empowered, spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, worship, the study of God's word, being planted in the local church, being in true fellowship with the saints of God. Beloved, this grace empowered spiritual disciplines will keep us abiding in Jesus. And when we abide in Jesus as his branch, you know, he will, he will prune us, but we'll become more and more fruitful, beloved. Our lives, our lives will be meaningful. We'll be full of the Holy Spirit full of the peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the hope of God. Yes, we'll go through testings and trials, but through every season of testing and trial, we will see that the, the, there's an increase in, in the things of God in our life. There's an increase of the anointing and the activity and, and the work of God in our life, bearing and causing an increase in, the, in our fruitfulness. Beloved, let us have fruitful lives, not fruitless lives. Fourthly, the greatest reward of prayer is God himself. The greatest reward. You know, when we pray, you know, there are things we're praying for. Of course, we're praying for ourselves. We're praying for our family. I have lists of points that I pray for. You know, praying for myself, praying for my family, praying for uh, the people I love, praying for the things of the kingdom, praying for Utsav. But beloved, as much as each one of those prayer points are important, the greatest reward of prayer is God himself. Us being in the presence of God. What did King David say? One thing I've desired of the Lord and that will I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. You know, we know this verse, such a beautiful promise. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Verse 12, then you will call upon me. What does God say? What happens when you call upon him? And come and pray to me. What happens when we come and pray to him? He says, and I will listen to you. Verse 13, you will seek me. What happens when we seek him? And find me. When you search for me with all your heart. Verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Beloved, what a, what a guarantee we have. God says, when you call upon me, you come and pray to me, I will listen to you. And when you seek me and search for me with all your heart, you will find me. The greatest reward of prayer is God himself, beloved. I want to encourage you that make God your exceedingly great reward as God told Abraham. What did God tell Abraham? You know, God gave Abraham such a mighty promise. He said, through your son, 
Isaac, I will bring forth a nation. And through that nation, I will bless all the nations of the earth. Through the, your family, I will bless all the families of the earth. God gave him a land. God gave him a name that will be remembered for every generation and throughout all eternity. God gave him a son in his old age, when he was 100 years old. God blessed him with a nation. And today, Abraham is known as the father of nations. He's known as the father of faith, of our faith. But what was God's, uh, what was Abraham's greatest reward? Not any of these blessings. Of course, they were blessings. Of course, they were promises fulfilled. But Abraham's greatest reward was God himself. Beloved, I want to encourage you. Let God be your greatest reward. Let God be my greatest reward. Let him be the reward of our family. Let him be our portion, our inheritance, beloved. And if you want that to happen, if you want to be known as a man and woman who's marked by the presence of God, if you want to be known as a family that's marked by the presence of God, if you want your house to carry the tangible presence and glory of God, we have to be men and women of prayer. Our families should be uh, families that are soaked in prayer. Couples, what is your greatest act together? Your greatest act together is when you worship and pray, beloved. That's when your intimacy will be beautiful. That's when your family life will be beautiful. That's when your parenting will be successful. That's where God will bless you in your health and your finances. That's when God will bless your weekends when you spend time together. Beloved, let us be men and women who are men and women of prayer. Men and women of the secret place. Men and women who know that I've got to wake up in the mornings and spend time with God. I've got to know now, I've got to shut the door and be with my father in the secret place. I've got to learn to say no. I've got to learn to wake up. I've got to learn to stay awake. I've got to learn to push aside things so that I make time in order to be with God. Beloved, when you make God your greatest pursuit, when you make God your greatest desire, your greatest passion, and I know that we cannot do that in our own, we need God to help us. When, but when you begin to make him your priority, then you will begin to see the fulfillment or the actualization of God's favor on your life. So beloved, I want to encourage you. Let us be like the sons of Issachar. Let us be men and women who know the times and seasons we're living in. Beloved, the coming of the Lord is near. It's nearer than we, than we even know. You know, there's going to be difficult times on the earth. Our nation is going through a difficult time. Persecution is increasing, beloved. I hope you've been keeping track of what has been happening. Pastors are being beaten up. Churches are being attacked. You know, innocent people are being attacked simply because they've made a choice to follow Jesus. You mean no harm to anyone. But in an unprecedented level, from all over India, we get repeated. Almost daily, I get reports of attacks over pastors and churches, over simple people. If some, if sometimes even children are not spared. Beloved, what is God telling us as a church in Mumbai? You think you are safe from it? Are you going to wait till it reaches your doorstep for you to wake up and say, oh, I need God? Beloved, our land needs the Lord. Our nation needs the Lord. What is the church going to do? We need to pray, beloved. We need to pray that God will embolden the church, that God will fill the church with his presence and his power, that God will cause us to be more intentional about preaching the gospel and about making disciples. In this time of trials and testings and persecution, we cannot be like the sons of Ephraim who turned back on the day of their battle. We cannot be like those who have their bows and arrows, who are archers, who are skilled, who are equipped. What are the use of everything that God has, not, has given you, but you're not employing it for the kingdom? What is the use of all the talent and the giftings and the finances and the resources and connections and whatever we have, you know, and we're not able to use it for the Lord. And we turn back on the day of battle. You know, people who are prayerless will chicken out, are cowards. They will not be able to stand because you cannot face these trials and testings in your own strength. I'm not saying that in a disrespectful way. I'm saying that in a very factual way. If we are not filled with it, you know, Peter thought that he could stand that day with his willpower. Lord, I will go with you to prison and to death. And we know what happened. He, he tried to use willpower. Jesus said that I prayed for you, Peter, that you will be able to be able to stand this test and you will come out of it. Because Satan has asked me, asked me for you to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. And that's why Peter was restored. Beloved, the trials and the testings that are coming our way as a church, 
We cannot stand against them in our own strength, beloved. We need the strength of God. We need, we need God to strengthen our hearts. We need God to strengthen our resolve. Our resolve is required, but our resolve is not enough. Our resolve must be anointed by God, filled with the power of God. You know, there are trials and testings that will come the way of your family. It will be at your workplace. It will come in your ministry. You cannot use human strength. You cannot just merely use human willpower. We need the power of God. And that will only come through prayer, beloved. I want to encourage you this morning. Let there be a shift. Let there be a returning to God. You know, the book of Joel, chapter 2, God tells his people, return to me even now. Return to me. Return to me. And when we return to him, we will experience his revival, his renewal, and his restoration. More of that will come in the coming weeks. But beloved, I want to, I want to encourage you and I want to request you, don't take this for granted. This is a simple word I've shared. I want to put it very loud and clear. You've got to make a choice today. Are you going to be a man and a woman of prayer or are you going to be a prayerless person? It will show in your life and it will show in all eternity. Make the wise and the good choice to be a man and woman of prayer. If you say, Shannon, I want to pray, but I've been struggling. I don't feel like praying. I've been struggling with laziness or with being overworked. Ask God to help you. Whenever I've dipped down in my prayer life, I've simply asked God and said, God, give me the desire to pray. Give me, increase in me the desire to pray. God, help me to pray. The Holy Spirit is our helper. If you pray that sincerely, that simple prayer, God will give you the desire to pray. You will be able to wake up early. You will be able to stay up late in the night. You will make time in your workplace. You will go out, skip your lunch or whatever is needed and you will see God. Because the desire to be with God, the desire to pray will help you overcome every obstacle inside and outside and you will break through by the power of God. Beloved, Make the choice. Be a man and a woman of prayer. Father, we want to thank you, God, for this word that has come this morning. And uh, Lord, even as I've shared this message, Lord, my words are empty without your power and your anointing. And so I pray right now that what I've brought forth, God, you will anoint it and you will take those words and stir up the hearts of all of us and the hearts of your people to seek you in prayer. God, we don't just want to be like a mountain experience where we climb up and come down the other side. We want this graph now to keep going up. Lord, I pray that there will be a shifting today, a returning to you, a, re, a resurgence, where a resurrendering to you, God, where we begin to call upon your name, seek you with all our heart, and we will be able to see your intervention. We will be able to see your work beginning. The Lord, with greater measure of power and glory in our lives, in our family, in your church, and through your church in this city and in this nation. Greater things have been done, but greater things are yet to come in the city, in this nation. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Therefore, we should even more be a people who are committed and devoted to prayer. Help us to be devoted to prayer like the early church. Help us to be men and women who pray. I pray for us, even as pastors, that we will be men and women of prayer, our ministry leaders, our life group leaders. God, that we will not be prayerless. We will be a prayerful people, God. Our congregation, all of our churches, our English church, Andri East Church, Andri West Church, our Hindi churches, our churches in Nala Sopara, Kopargao, Jabalpur. God, that we will, Burvli, God, we will be churches of prayer, God. Houses of prayer, our life groups will be places of prayer, not just chatter, 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 but places of prayer. God, we'll be soaked in prayer. Our marriages will be soaked in prayer. Our parenting will be soaked in prayer. Our workplaces will be soaked in prayer. Our life groups will be soaked in prayer. God, our ministries will be soaked in prayer. God, I pray that our days will be soaked in prayer. I pray for release of the anointing of prayer over Utsav, that Utsav will break through in prayer, God. I pray that we will not make excuses that I cannot pray because of this or that or that. Even, Lord, when we come together, God, for prayer, I pray that our people will come together to pray, O oh God. Lord, so many times in your word, you have commanded us to assemble together, to gather together for prayer. The elders, to the people, to the priests, to the children and the parents, God, even nursing infants, you have commanded us to gather and pray. And how many excuses we have made and how many times we have found reasons to not come, O oh God. Lord, I pray, forgive us, Lord, for being a people who have been prayerless. And I pray that you would have mercy on us. Change our hearts. Change the direction of our hearts. Pour out your grace. Pour out in us the desire to pray. Pour out upon us the anointing to pray. That we will be a people who will seek 
you with all our hearts because the greatest reward that you promised us is that we will find you. We commit ourselves, our family, and Utsav into your hands. Make us a people and a house of prayer. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 